FMD is a business that's been around since 2001. And, and in simple terms, we see our role is to partner with successful Australians to help them achieve their life goals. Our focus, of course, is on the financial aspects of that. We've, in an industry, I, I suspect, that's been challenged for a long time, we've got a proven advice model with transparent fees that really genuinely delivers for our clients. And one important aspect of that is our highly respected investment committee. We invest a lot in that committee and uh, at times like these and across this year, that really proves its worth as many of our clients can attest to. So if, if you're uh, joining us today and you're perhaps um, at one of those little crossroads in life or you're just thinking about seeking financial advice, we'd certainly welcome a conversation with you and, um, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, I'd like to introduce to you David McMillan. David's spoken to our clients before and uh, it was a few years ago now actually and was quite a bit of interest at that point in time. Um, I thought it would be really interesting to, to have David speak to our clients again today um, because um, after speaking to him recently, his views on what's happening in the, in the residential property market uh, are perhaps a bit at odds with what other people have been saying. And so uh, one of those things, when you get information that's a bit different to what you're, what you're hearing, you can do two things. You can put your head in your sand or you can question it. And uh, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to, to hear a slightly different view to what's happening in the property market today. Um, David's very well placed to, to present this information to us. He's been working in the, the real estate industry for for over 20 years now. And importantly, his business, and he'll explain a little about his business, but a really important part about his business that, that FMD likes is the research aspects to what he does. And so it's, and it's the research today that he's going to share. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I'd just like to uh, introduce David and to uh, share some insights into what's happening in the, in the residential property market. And, um, and then we'll come back in about 20 minutes or so for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for that uh, warm introduction. Thank you to the uh, wider FMD team for having me on. And uh, obviously, thank you to Jen for organising. Um, look, a little bit about uh, us. My name is David McMillan, Director of Performance Property. We've been running for about 10 years. Um, we started off um, as a data business and then morphed into a property advisory business. We spend half a million dollars a year on uh, our data business, understanding how the market moves uh, and why, and, and obviously off the back of that, giving our clients um, uh, advice so that they can make better decisions in the marketplace. We buy prestige homes for our clients, we give property investment advice, and we also manage properties around the country. Uh, before we start today, just so everyone knows, the information today is of a general nature only, and if you've got specific, um, uh, or if you want specific property advice, please reach out to your FMD advisor and, and they may uh, then on refer them to us for, for a chat. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, what's happening in the marketplace right now uh, and how that's different to perhaps uh, what the media are reporting, how we make decisions in times like this. I mean, it's very challenging with so much noise going on, uh, so many views around how the economic um, outlook is, 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 is looking. So in the midst of turmoil, how do we actually make good quality decisions? We'll talk about the current fun fundamentals, discuss whether we're optimistic or pessimistic about the markets, and uh, of course, let you know our, our advice to clients at the moment. So what's happening in the marketplace right now? Um, contrary to what the media are reporting, uh, there is no discounting. Okay, so we're not seeing any discounting on um, A-grade stock in Melbourne. Uh, or Adelaide or Brisbane or Sydney or Perth. Um, A-grade stock, what we're talking about there is housing um, within school belt sort of distance, you know, mi middle ring or, or inner ring. All that product is holding up very well across the country and, in fact, in some cases rising. In Sydney, we're seeing some really strong evidence of price rises at certain price points and obviously there's markets within markets in terms of geographic locations and price points. Um, if we talk specifically about um, home buying and homes, um, we're seeing uh, both Melbourne and Sydney rise a little bit. 
Um, and specifically in Sydney, we're actually seeing some quite significant price movement around that $1.5 to $3 million mark. You know, prices up 25% over the last six months, um, which is which is pretty um, crazy when you think about how the media are reporting this crisis. Um, there is discounting going on. Um, of course, there was some panic selling at the start of this crisis. People were really unsure about how it was going to unfold. So there was some a panic selling. There was some discounting early on. Now there is still some discounting, but it's mainly on the, the sort of property that the market passes over anyway. So if you're thinking about, you know, main row properties or properties that, um, you know, perhaps have some inferior qualities, bad floor plans, uh, poor natural light, uh, pro close proximity to train lines, service stations, pubs, all that sort of stuff. Yes, there is some discounting going on, but it is not on the A-grade stock, as I mentioned. Um, we are not experiencing any discounting in our core investment markets. Our investment markets change as the cyclical patterns change around the country. Currently, our investment markets are Brisbane, Adelaide, Bendigo and Perth. We're not seeing any discounting in those markets. And in fact, we're, we're seeing a meaningful evidence of price rises so the big thing at the moment in terms of what a lot of people worry about is the banks for selling property. Now, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wide range of people that income, uh, but the banks are not for selling those properties yet. Uh, it, is, it is possible that the banks will for sell um, uh, properties, of course, but that's not going to happen until at least the middle of next year and possibly into 2022. I've spoken to a number of people within the banks at very senior levels and they have no intention of throwing everything out into the market in March next year and creating, you know, 10,000 for sales and crashing the market. They're going to work with people as much as they can to try and get them back on their feet. Um, and, and I don't see any pressure from the banks trying to push these out before the economic restrictions are lifted. So giving people a chance to actually get back on their feet before they force sell them. And I think that's an important point to make in the market that I don't think there's going to be an event where everything's going to come to the market at one time. Right now, we're probably seeing the, the least mortgage in position sales than we've ever seen because of course the banks aren't mortgage in position sales selling anything at the moment. Uh, for every one property that, that, that it, that's on the market, there's one to two properties off market. Our buyer agent network is trading at the moment, largely off market properties. That's not just in Melbourne, but it's all over the country. So stock, num stock on market numbers are down on realestate.com, but there is a meaningful amount of people wanting to sell. They've let their agent that they want to sell, but they don't want to take it to market now in Melbourne because they can't. Uh, but of course, in other parts of the country, they don't want to take it to the market because they feel like the market's no good because they've been watching the news. So there's a lot of off market going uh, activity going on. Deals are still being done. Um, even in Melbourne right now, there's deals still being done, but deals are still being done across the country just to reduce levels. As a business, our volume's off about 30%. As a home buying business, our volume's off 10%. So the home, the home buying side's actually trading pretty well. Um, look, the key theme, and we'll touch on it multiple times throughout this presentation, is that we are dealing with far less stock on market. And, um, and, and, and when you look at A-grade stock, where we're dealing with um, you know, a real scarcity, and that's not just in Melbourne, that's across the country. We catch up with um, our 30 buyer agents every Monday morning and on the call, everyone's got the same problem, whether they're in Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, they can't get their hands on quality property to place with clients. And, and as a result, clients who used to take, say, 30 days um, are now taking 60 to 90 days and, and, and they're missing out. And there's multiple piece, people missing out and that could cause the market to get quite aggressive. This is not a credit crisis. So importantly, you know, different to the GFC, this is not a credit crisis. This is a health crisis. There's, you know, there's obviously economic restrictions going on, but the banks are still lending to credit worthy borrowers. Yes, there's less credit worthy borrowers, but the question is, is the amount of people that are accessing credit to buy homes outstripping the number of homes that are for sale? And currently that's definitely the case. So look, I don't want to talk about this side too much, but Debt, we are going into debt, um, national debt, and uh, after this crisis, it looks like that debt will be 45% of GDP. Importantly, this is the debt to GDP going back over the last 100 years. Importantly, at the end of the Spanish flu, uh, debt to GDP was also 45%, as you can see here, and, and debt to GDP has been much higher after World War II. Uh, but if you think about the 20s, the 20s were a very prosperous time, and if you could be invested in the early 20s, 
not this is the 1920s I'm talking about. Um, I'm sure a well diversified portfolio would have done really well. Now, of course, the 1930s came, and that's that's a discussion for 10 years away. But um, it is possible that the amount of stimulus, the low interest rates, cause uh, you know the opposite effect of what people are feeling at the moment. So instead of you know asset prices falls, they may actually rise too much, and we may go into some sort of um, or run into some sort of more serious problems down the road. But I think that importantly, anyone that thinks that the market can't grow with, with these debt levels, these national debt levels, um, just needs to draw some comparison to the 1920s. Um, and in the 1920s, asset prices did really well. In terms of our forecast, we're assuming the governments are going to behave this way. So if they behave a different way, we reserve the right to obviously review our forecast. But um, we think that, and I've highlighted the, the way that we think the governments will provide um, uh, stimulus and relief during this period will, will most likely sound like this. The federal and state governments will pr provide sufficient relief throughout this crisis and will prioritise growing GDP and getting back to full employment before paying back debt. Now, that's, that's key to this forecast because if the government raised taxes next year, uh, that will have a significant uh, detrimental effect on where we think house prices are going to be. Josh Frydenberg has come out and said multiple times, and it's been documented in a lot of place, places, that how you how you how you get out of this crisis is not by increasing taxes. It's it's by growing GDP and and, and stimulating the market. So um, that's the the nature of the house price forecast that you're going to see today. And of course, if you're more pessimistic than that, if you don't believe that, well then then you know, this house price forecast probably won't make sense to you. But this is what we believe is what the governments are going to do. Um, now, in terms of making decisions through a crisis, it's obviously incredibly difficult because there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of opinions out there. Um, and there's also a lot of really bad data out there, namely the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate, you know, consumer confidence, all these metrics are, you know, in many cases, more volatile than what we've seen before. But I think uh, one thing that we need to remember about property, of course, is that people have to live somewhere. And uh, so if they're not buying, they're renting. They can't disappear, unlike the demand for um, equities, for example. And what we saw in the 1930s, in the Great Depression, uh, we saw that uh, rents actually rose during that period. So even though that um, the, you know unemployment got up to 20%, even though that there was mass unemployment, um, one side of this property equation was still working and that was there was income there for landlords. And I think um, what we need to appreciate is short term, anything can happen in any market, uh, including property. And it is possible that prices do fall, but medium term and, and, and all investments should be long term, but medium to long term property has to move to the fundamentals. People talk about the fundamentals, but I just want to let you know what we believe they are. So in, 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 in Australia, we're getting um, a baseline of 140,000 uh, births and strong migration of 200,000. So people is the demand side of the equation. Obviously that natural increase is really important. Um, and obviously at the moment, that 200,000 um, overseas migration is not coming in, but it will come in. They will open up the borders at some point. This, this crisis will end. It might be next year, it could be the year after. No one actually really knows, but medium term, we will open up our borders. Overseas migrants will come back in and that demand will, will wash its way through the market. At the moment, we've got a current undersupply. We went into this market undersupplied. We weren't building enough for about the last three or four years. Uh, and so that's a big part of our forecast at the moment is the market should hold up really well because we went into it undersupplied. Ongoing, the RBA have just put out a a really good paper around why the market's likely to be undersupplied for the next three to five years. And it's because the planning process is so still so um, tough to get through that it looks like we're going to be undersupplied for some time. And uh, it's, it's a constrained sort of event. Like you can't just push property out to market. You got to get it through planning and that's taking too long. And that was the basis of the, the RBA um, paper. Now um, inflation. So the, the RBA, are trying to hit their inflation targets, that inflation should go through to wage growth, that should go through to rent growth, and that should be capitalised into the price of real estate. So that's always coming through the market. We've got an organised government. Now, like I know that uh, if you're in Victoria like I am, you're really questioning this right now, but when I'm talking about organised, organized, I'm talking about comparisons to the 1890s, which was our largest property crash. 
property in Melbourne came off 50%, property in Sydney came off 30%. And I'm talking about the 1930s where property in Melbourne and Sydney both came off uh, around 25%. So by comparison to those property crashes, our government is, 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 is very much um, organised. Uh, they're able to stimulate the market faster. They're able to r read what's happening in the market in a, in a better setting because they've got obviously access to data real time. And so I think that um, that is a key positive, not just in this crisis, but crisis is moving forward. Um, and lastly, efficiency gains from technology or infrastructure are historically priced into the value of real estate. So this used to be, you know, a train line going in, um, you know, property values in that area would, would rise because of better access to the city and better access to other amenities. Um, but of course, what we're seeing uh, today is uh, the, the, you know, the work from home movement, if you like. Um, culturally, it's acceptable to now work from home and the technology is there to support it. So um, some of the lifestyle areas around Australia um, have a very high chance of outperforming their capital city counterparts. And that's something that we need to factor into our modelling. When we look at all these years, um, those of you who follow uh, economics will understand that these years were all economic contractions. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's important to see what nationally property prices did during these economic contractions, because there has been some pretty dire forecasts for national property prices, you know, up to 20%, 30% falls, 10% fall. But everyone was almost unanimous that, that the property markets would fall in this economic contraction. Um, and so I thought it might be worthwhile looking at uh, back through history since 1970 and see what has happened through each of these economic contractions. And you can see the share market in the blue and the property market in the orange. The share market um, obviously pulled back at each of these economic contractions um, is 73, 82, 89, 2001, 2008, and, and obviously this most recent crisis. And, then, and equally, the share market bounced back just as quick. So, um, you know, crisis has end, the markets recover. Uh, and that's going to be nothing new to, to, to a lot of clients, um, especially if they've been invested in some, for some time. But when we look at the national property market and how it behaved through this crisis, as you can see that, um, this, this is zero here, you can see that um, property prices nationally never went down after an economic contraction. They went down nationally in 2011 because of rising interest rates and in 2018 because of uh, election, Royal Commission, but never did they go down because of an economic contraction. And part of the reason why we believe that happens is because um, after economic contractions, what you see is you see is the RBA cut the interest rate, money gets cheaper, not too many people sell because they think the market's bad. And in fact, when you had a look at Melbourne and Sydney post GFC, uh, the market went up 20%. Um, and a lot of people forget that, that, uh, you know, that was a credit crisis. It was a really bad a financial crisis. It was a contraction in the economy, but prices in Melbourne and Sydney went up 20% because there was no stock uh, and cheap money. And, 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 and that's historically what can happen. So one thing that I want to uh, leave um, everyone with, if nothing else, is that a economic contraction or a recession does not necessarily mean that property prices have to fall. And in fact, they've never fallen since 1970. So it's important to keep in mind, especially for those clients out there who are thinking about, oh my God, the market's going to fall. I should sell now to, 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 to take my profit or, you know, sit on a meaningful pile of cash. Um, in terms of how the market works, um, in terms of, you know, us trying to read price movement, what we look at is does demand exceed supply? Is the market affordable and does the market have confidence? So we're just gonna explore that in a little bit of detail nationally and, and, and also at a micro level. So as I mentioned before, you know, 140,000, the blue line here is natural births, 140,000, natural births and around 200,000 overseas migration. That's what the profile of demand was looking like coming through prior to the crisis. Um, and the construction peak, so the, this is dwelling approvals, the construction peak was back in 2015. And for the last sort of three years, we simply hadn't been building enough for the population coming through. Um, and what that has resulted in, even in this climate, and this climate being that we're not getting overseas migrants, the vacancy rate has come down. So even though our borders are shut, our vacancy rates are falling, which is very hard to believe. But the reality is, is because we have been underbuilding, 
and this line really needs to be above 200,000 to support the population that was coming through because we've been underbuilding nationally vacancy rates have fallen nationally we're seeing rents actually rise through this cl climate not everywhere but in certain markets now the markets that are sort of suffering a slight oversupply at the moment are Melbourne and Sydney you can see the vacancy rates in Melbourne and Sydney this is the year on year change from July to July have risen in Melbourne and Sydney but they've gone down in Brisbane they've gone down in Adelaide they've gone down in Darwin they've gone down in Canberra slightly up in Hobart and they've gone dramatically down in Perth. Now in Melbourne and Sydney, obviously, you know, millennials have moved back home because they don't have work. Millennials who are gonna leave home didn't leave home because um, they can't afford it. We're not getting our overseas migrants. We're not getting our students. A lot of Airbnbs have been pushed back to permanent rentals. Same with service departments or, um, you know, professional lets, they're all gone back onto the permanent rental market. So that is causing some rental softness in Melbourne and Sydney. And we expect this trend to continue for at least the six, next six months. So we're expecting weak um, rental conditions in Melbourne and Sydney uh, for six, 12, maybe even 18 months. Uh, and in fact, until the borders, borders start to open, I think that that would be the case. So if you're a landlord out there and you have to take 50 bucks a week less, um, that's probably gonna be uh, the, the norm, you know, 5, 10, 15% falls in rentals. Conversely, in Brisbane, uh, Adelaide and Perth, we're seeing rents rise and that's where we're directing a lot of our investor capital right now. Um, this, this is the stock on market, as I mentioned. Stock on market is very tight across the country. Um, you can see here that nationally stock on market is down 10% and in every market bar Sydney, stock is down and stock will be even more dramatically down in Melbourne next time these figures come out because no real estate agent's been at a list in the last sort of six weeks. And, and uh, you know, in addition to that, not only have they not been at a list, they haven't been able to go out there and get their open for inspection list, which are then, that's what they use to generate their next listings. So it could be for the next two quarters that stock on market in Melbourne is actually down really significantly. Uh, but nationally, we have a problem. We, we, there's not enough properties to buy and that is causing a demand supply imbalance and that's causing the opposite to perhaps what you believe to be happening out there, which prices should be falling, but they're, but they're not. Um, now, the, the reduction for the RBA cash rate at 0.25 is significant and it's significant because most investors who are holding property now, even if they're bought recently, if they can get their interest rate down to 2.1 or 2.5, most, invest, most investment deals now are cash positive. Uh, not negatively geared, they're cash positive. Uh, most investment deals that people go into now will be cash flow neutral or cash flow positive. Um, and what that means, it means that the yield is high enough to uh, pay for all the outgoings, including interest. Um, and, and with the yield being that high, what that means is rents are high uh, by comparison to, to, to the affordability. And so um, it's cheaper for renters to convert into home ownership. So when you think about someone being in a position where they've lost their job and they want to go back to the rental pool because you know, it might be cheaper, it's not cheaper, it's cheaper for them to stay in ownership. And um, it's cheaper for renters who can actually get access to debt and have the confidence to go and buy because they've got income security to convert into home ownership. And I'm having those conversations every day with people. Uh, mortgage interest, interest is 25 to 35% cheaper than 18 months ago. And uh, historically, when we see the, 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 this, you know, it's not just that debt becomes cheaper, it's that banks are willing to lend more as well. And people typically take that money when demand exceeds supply and they go out and spend it because they have to, to compete in the marketplace. So affordability is at um, 10 year lows in, 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 in most markets, but in some markets it's the most affordable that it's ever been. And the way we measure affordability is, um, and this is Melbourne, this is the affordability index in Melbourne, 26% of the average um, wage in Melbourne would go to the average new mortgage in 1980. Right, and at the moment, 33% of the average wage would go to the average new mortgage in Melbourne. And this is principal and interest. This is assuming the standard variable rate, average income, and and property prices with a 20% deposit. So you can see post GFC, um, in the lead up to the GFC, 55% of the average house, of the average income would go to the average mortgage. Immediately uh, post GFC, they slashed interest rates, creating affordability, and 37% of the average wage went to the average new mortgage and the Melbourne property prices jumped 20%. The red line here is the year on year price change. Um, what we know about Melbourne is every time the affordability index in Melbourne gets to 50 or 55, you can see the year on year price um, uh, movement goes negative. So you, can, you saw that in 1989, 1990, you saw it in 2008, prices came off, but then they jumped again. You saw it in 2011, 
uh, Melbourne prices uh, came went negative and, and we've seen it most recently in 2018. So there's a limit from an affordability perspective as to how far Melbourne prices can run because people can't service loans past a certain point. And that's heavily influenced by interest rates. And with the cutting of interest rates, you can see that the, the Melbourne market is the most affordable it's been now since 2009 where prices went up 20%. And if we go back to the preceding period when it was this affordable, uh, the Melbourne market went up 14%, 12%, 2%, 6%, 8%. So, um, Look, affordability may trump sentiment, and certainly that is what we're seeing the initial signs happening. We're seeing that happening in Sydney, and we're seeing a 25% price movement on some properties. We're seeing record numbers through open for inspections. We're seeing huge volume of bidders at Sydney auctions, right? Now, Melbourne may be a different story because these economic con con constrictions here uh, may hurt us a bit more, but you know we have to adjust our forecast as new information comes in, and this is the way we see it at the moment. Now, Brisbane, um, equally, Brisbane's the most affordable it's been since 2001. And in 2001 in Brisbane, the market went up 16%, 25%, 33%, 7%, 4%. So it had a huge run when the, when the market historically was this low. We're seeing prices rise in, in Brisbane, not as aggressively as Sydney, but we're seeing prices rise in Brisbane at the moment. Adelaide, Adelaide's the most affordable it's been since 2002. And, and in 2002, the Adelaide market went up 18%. The year after 22%, the year after 21%. So you can see when affordability gets this low, when there's enough confidence or when there, when demand exceeds supply, the market can run, it can run aggressively. And that's the way we're reading the market at the moment. We're not reading the market like we're on the cusp of a cliff. We're reading it like the conditions that are, that are in front of us look like that there's a stronger, much stronger probability of price rises and they could be quite aggressive. Uh, Perth, Perth is the most affordable it's been since um, 19... 88, believe it or not. And in 1988 in Perth, house prices doubled. And yes, I've checked that stat multiple times. House prices doubled in one year. And Perth hasn't really grown in 12 years. And if, you, if you're watching the commodity price cycle, it looks like this could be, you know, the, the next um, market that grows really strongly. Uh, and we're certainly positioning a lot of investor capital into Perth. Sorry, I'm just checking the time because I know I'm going over. I told Lee I'd stick to 20 minutes. Um, so I'm just wrapping up now. Confidence is hurting. Before the crisis, it was strong. During the crisis, it was extremely low. We are now starting to get better with the exception of Melbourne. But there's no question that confidence is, is, is a negative. You can see from the summary, demand does exceed supply. So that's slightly positive. The market is massively affordable, but we have confidence issues. And it's just a matter of how much these confidence issues play through the market at the moment. And, and, and how the, the government manages to stimulate the market and, and get this under unemployment rate under control. We see that um, there is a 60% chance of prices rising in Melbourne. Um, and we, we see that there's a 70% chance of price rise in Sydney. We're already seeing that now we see an 85% uh, chance of price rises in all these other markets. Um, this should be 60, 40, not 60, 30. There is a chance that prices in Melbourne and Sydney fall because of things that we can't see. So we're not blind to that. We think if they do fall, prices in Melbourne and Sydney could fall up to 20, 25% because of where they are. And when they rise, we also think that there is a limit to how much they can rise because of where their affordability maximums will kick in. But as you can see in Brisbane, Adelaide, Bendigo and Perth, we see limited chance of um, downside. We see not that much downside if it does happen. And we see a, a lot of upside. So um, hopefully you can see why we position our investor capital in these markets at the moment. Uh, if, you're, if you're a homeowner in Melbourne or Sydney, you, you should be quite cautious about selling um, because it, 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 it may be that the market does rise. So maybe a conversation around the reasons why you're selling and the timing of when you would sell if you didn't sell now is important. Um, medium term, this is our property clock. This is all the markets around the country. I can give that to you, post this if anyone wants it out there. Any of the FMD clients, just contact your advisor and we'll be able to push that out. Um, but here's our advice to clients. Our forecasts have not changed medium term. It looks like the confidence issues and the unemployment issues that we're having are being trunked by low stock and low interest rates. Uh, there's been no change to our clients other than to increase their cash buffers, those that are building portfolios. Our, our recommendation to clients is to continue on with their long-term strategies as normal and not to hold back on buying because it may be that they're chasing the market up. It may be that the market does soften a little bit in certain places, but if it's a long-term strategy, they will be evened out over time. Um, and Melbourne and Sydney, this is probably the most important point. We do feel that there's a greater probability of price rises than price falls, even with the extension that Daniel Andrews is, has put forward because at this stage, the biggest issue is 
um, buyers actually being able to find something, and 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 combine that with low interest rates, and you've got a recipe for a for for a price run, not a price fall. We'll take questions now. Uh, thank you for for, for listening.